Hi, and welcome everyone. Today I have the pleasure of inviting Michael, Dr. Michael Malora with us. Hi, Michael. It's good to see you. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You're welcome. Uh, well, as I start a lot of these interviews out, I always like to know a little bit about the background of my speaker, um, kind of how, where they came from, their background, and how they've ended up doing the work they're doing, because there are similar themes despite the individual stories, you know, which speak to the Phoenix Rising in the process of how we've come to become more connected to our spirituality. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm originally from New York, and uh, I'm a dream specialist, psychologist. Dream uh, is my specialty. I do, uh, and I'm also a composer. Um, I spent most of my life as a composer, um, studying music and the performative aspects of music as an expression, as a communication. And um, uh, I have a master's degree from New York University and a master's degree from the University of Miami. And then I got my PhD in uh, Jungian driven psychology from Pacifica um, here in California. Um, my primary interest was always about the best ways to understand the unconscious. And I, I coming from music, I think I had uh, this fascination with the idea of dream imagery as some way of accessing uh, ideas, thoughts, feelings that aren't conscious, uh, but more unconscious. And I, and I think with music, music comes from a, a deep part of the soul. Um, it's very instinctive. It's not, I think, as ego-driven as people maybe imagine it because of pop music and things like that. But I really always felt that music was the language of the unconscious, that that was my ex personal experience uh, um, in trying to understand um, what was not known. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I've always been absolutely fascinated by dreams and music. These are my two things that are kind of going back and forth in my life. I'm an avid, you know, I was a very lucid dreamer as a kid. Um, and when I was younger, I used to actually even compose music that was inspired by dreams. And um, I ended up uh, having a career as a composer for films some uh, feature films uh, that were spiritually driven and uh, documentaries and other subject matters, also some dramas. But I was always interested in the language that music draws on between the image and uh, expression and reception and how we perceive these things. And um, I got really, really uh, inspired by certain thinkers, composers, guys like John Cage, uh, Meredith Monk. Um, these are people who actually were more into the exploration of music as uh, the semiology of music. Um, how music uh, works on a cultural level and through the imagination. And the idea was to bridge the gap between what we're experiencing in life and how we process it. And, um, you know, my, my blessing I think has always been this interest in sound um, and when I started to study Jungian psychology you know there was a lot of work about you know um, how to understand the unconscious and you know Jung of course was very had introduced the idea of active imagination uh, using art to um, provide more information about images and how they impact us and, and to try to understand the unconscious. Um, and uh, there's also been a lot of work with the embodiment through dance, through uh, body movement and things like that. But uh, there wasn't a whole lot about music itself. So that became my contribution to the work. So I did my dissertation on music and dream work. And that's how I kind of, I guess, ended up where I am now, which was with a private practice working with patients um, using dream and music work. And at the same time, I'm composing music for various projects. Wow, yes, right on target with this subject here, the, the Phoenix Rising, the Euro Phoenix Rising. So let's talk about the correlation between creativity and spirit. How do you see that showing up in your work? 
Well, I mean, I think creativity is a function. Uh, it's a function of the soul. And when we talk about soul, I think we should first recognize that according to like some key thinkers like Carl Jung and, uh, you know, James Hillman and other death psychologists, soul is the embodiment of all things. We might call it the universe. Other people call it, you know, uh, God, whatever it is. I, I think soul, when we refer to uh, soul, we're talking about we are inside soul, not we have a soul. Mm -hmm. And creativity is a function at least from this perspective, as an expression of soul through our bodies, uh, through our experience of consciousness. So in the creative action, really, um, function, we are accessing different parts of what we would call soul, the collective unconscious, which then becomes an expression of the spirit. The idea here, too, is that, uh, at least from this perspective, psycho psychological perspective, we're looking for the ways in which soul expresses itself to find healing so we can transcend and move beyond the actual experience of whatever it is we might be suffering from, whether it's anxiety, depression, um, hallucinations, whatever uh, the world calls the symptoms, mm -hmm. but to try to understand how the body and the mind and the spirit connects through creativity, through what is also called the imagination. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole world out there of literature. Um, and I want to also say most of what I'm saying is an original. <laughs> I want to honor the ancestors that, you know, bring whatever I'm bringing to this conversation with love and respect, because I, it's my teachers that have taught me everything that I know. So, um, and there's a whole world of literature that is called imaginal psychology, which is the access of the imagination through image and the way in which we express ourselves through the images when image could be anything from music to you and I having this conversation to these glasses to whatever it is. Um, image all is an, a creative expression of soul that is leading us towards something that is healing us either on a personal level or a collective unconscious level. Mm -hmm. So a moment ago, you mentioned something about the, we are in soul. And it also occurred to me that from the opposite uh, vantage point, when we hear music or something of the imagination, that also helps us to get back into our soul. Like mm -hmm. you're an outside stimulus, and this allows us to come back and connect. So this is a, a cycle or full circle. We begin with the soul. We have, for whatever distortion or reason, we are cut off from it. And then that from out there helps us come back full cycle to more of who we are. Yeah, it stems from the, the idea that when we come into the world, we forget. We start the process of what's called forgetting. Mm -hmm. um, and then we start the process of remembering, which is kind of putting ourselves back together again, one way after another. And sometimes this leads to something that we refer to um, is the idea of the personality goes through many deaths in a lifetime. And um, at least from the psychological perspective, we come into the world and we are, go from one trauma event to another trauma event. And after each one, there's kind of a new aspect of the personality that is getting reinvented or remembered or forgotten um, with each experience. So it is coming uh, in the idea of soul becoming an expression of how we remember who we really are deep when we connect with the true self. Um, but the ego keeps kind of going through the, the uh, cycles of life over and over and over again and trying to find its way back to the true center, which is the, the true center of the circle of life. You know, that's why... Um, in depth psychology, we, the sacred image is the mandala, which, uh, you know, Carl Jung, uh, you know, uh, painted many times. And 
very beautiful. Those are beautiful images that are, if when he was asked, basically this was he was painting his soul and the different incarnations of the personality in its attempt to find individuation, which is wholeness. And all of it is about the recycling and the patterns that are leading us to some sense of wholeness. And I think that connects to the Phoenix Rising idea. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's, it's synonymous. It's just a different way of expressing it. And uh, something that popped in my mind, I had an interview with a gentleman last night from the UK, and his theme is mainly the dark night of the soul. But it's really, I think I want to say, it's not the dark night of the soul as much as it is the dark night of the ego, because it's mm. the ego that's breaking down during this process, not the mm. soul. The soul is actually, it's, it's that disintegration is providing more room for the soul to express itself. Yeah, I mean, um, from I mean that's a complicated idea to a certain extent. Um, but one thing that, at least from this perspective, is that everything, everything is soul. Uh, the ego is, I think, as you just noticed, uh, but part, it part of soul. is part of soul. Mm -hmm. it, everything is an expression mm -hmm. of soul. Um, there, it goes back to the very old kind of Vedic ideas that you know we came. Why are we here? We are here as manifestations of soul, God, creation, whatever you want to call it, in order for it to experience life. Right. Um, and, you know, there's different manifestations of that. But, you know, ego is a necessary part of soul. <laughs> it's a necessary function. That's why, um, you know, it's very interesting. Most of ailments, like if we talk in terms of pathology and psychology, you know, people who come to me with, you know, um, anxiety, depression, um, suicidal ideation, whatever it might be, hallucinations, delusions, um, the perspective that we're coming from, or at least I'm coming from, is that everything is, is kind of, is, is an expression of ego which is then also an expression of a creative part of, of being um, and all in an effort for it to know itself because it comes from this other really interesting idea that all symptoms are expressions, creative expressions, maybe suffering, um, maybe disturbing, absolutely, but also some of it is very beautiful. Um, but all of it is there as a creative function that is leading us towards the healing of itself and the knowing of the self. Because it, it also stems from this idea that we can't know each other. We can't really see each other. Um, we can't see ourselves. And if you think about this, this is very true. You can't ever really know who you are. <laughs> so we rely on our our experiences in order to try to define what we're doing. But when we get to the true essence of who we are, we go beyond the image or what we're seeing and get to what we're not seeing. Right. And it's really, really interesting because it's all about knowing itself. And then if based on religious ideas, um, if that's where you're coming from, it is about kind of know, God wants to know him or herself. And um, that's kind of what's happening with all this, expression so ego is a function of it all is that i hope that makes sense I, it did I'm talking about a lot of things here at once but i hope no no i'm following you and i appreciate that distinction you made because it's interesting with this topic there's different levels and layers in in words and ways to express and i think that's part of what's happening now too is we're sussing out how does this fit? Does it not? Can it be tweaked? What's real? I mean, there's a lot of this that I find coming up in terms of terminology and mm -hmm. perspective, because it is, there are so many elements and so many vantage points sometimes to look at a particular thing. And this is part of the exploration that we're in right now, I believe. It's just, it's part of it. Um, so it did make sense. And when you spoke of that, that expression of the ego, it also brings to mind the aspect of uh, the difference in a spiritual awakening and a, in a type of um, actual pathology or psychotic break sometimes, mm -hmm. because yeah. things, those things can express very similarly. And I think that's an important thing to touch on as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a, a phenomenology or uh, an experience that is very common with people who become very highly uh, or opened up their heart 
the heart opening chakra experience that often happens in the spiritual event of actually brushing up against what would be the true self mm -hmm. can be very overwhelming to the senses because it's not something that it's expecting. <laughs> right. um, most of us operate on the level that we see, you know, where you're kind of going through life and everything is about, you know, uh, having a safe place to live, making a living and, and uh, having children and raising them properly. And, and all these wonderful things that are part of life. But then there's another aspect to life, which is why are we here? What happens to us when, we're, when we pass on or what happened to us before we were born? And what is our purpose and what is our mission here? And then the uh, expression of a deeper part of the self becomes very interesting. And I think people move towards something creative in the imagination and also something that is undeniably soulful. When they brush up against it, doing whatever it is they might be doing, whether it's meditation or yoga or different forms of spiritual practices, and they brush up against that release of the Kundalini Shakti uh, energy that moves through the spine and into the heart, it's, it's like a, a shocking experience. And it's not one that can often sustain itself for too long. Unless you really, unless you live in a cave in Tibet, you know, um, you know, or in the Himalayas, and and like you can really sustain that 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 shakti and, and contain it in the way that it needs to be done. But living in the world, it's very overwhelming and often shows up in uh, people that become very either disillusioned from the experience or heightened from the experience and become, you know, kind of obsessed about it. And then sometimes they feel like they're literally losing their mind because they are. Yes. <laughs> but, but I mean that in, a, in a, actually a kind of a beautiful way because uh, in a spiritual sense, the idea is to quiet the mind yeah. and go to silence and, and just to allow the soul to be uh, what it naturally and organically wants to be, which is just love. Um, but when we come into this world and we're overwhelmed by everything else, there's a lot of contradictions, there's a lot of hypocrisy, and, you know, and we break, you know, and then we seek some spiritual help or therapeutic help, and, and that's something that we, um, you know, I, I personally work with a lot with in, in my line of work. I'm so glad we're talking about this aspect. It's very interesting and I think it's very pertinent in terms of what a lot of people are experiencing right now. And this is exactly mm -hmm. the kind of thing that I wanted to have as discussion as part of the series because I've been through this. I know a lot of other people are going through it and it's no uh, cakewalk. There's a no. lot that goes no. on. Uh, and, it, and I have said in kind of back to early days when this was really kicking in for me, I often said, I feel like I'm losing my mind. And it wasn't before long when, that I realized, I actually, I am losing my mind, at least the grip it had on me, at least the way it presented itself. And, and now it's the heart leading the mind. But mm -hmm. that, that, is, that journey, that process, is, um, it's, a, it's a very intense thing. Yeah, it, it, it involves a lot of surrender. Uh, you know, and this is like kind of like the overwhelming tsunami of the Kali energy that comes into our space and feels very destructive on a certain level. But then there's also an overwhelming experience of love and heart opening types of action. But it leaves the ego kind of a little frightened because its job is to keep us alive, uh, keep us survival. And it's kind of going, hey, wait a minute, don't drop the shields. What's going on here? <laughs> you know, this world is very scary uh, in, uh, from an egoic perspective. And, you know, everything that's going on in the world these days would certainly alarm us on some level if we're going to perceive it from the egoic perspective. Um, but when we go into the heart space, you know, it becomes a little scary, you know, because there's different ways of dealing with incoming, um, threatening, stimulus so to speak and uh, if we operate from the heart I mean this was very alarming for me because I was raised as your classic neurotic New Yorker with all my defenses <laughs> up all the time you know and um, when I had a heart opening experience I suddenly kind of went from being a very radical sort of 
liberal type of guy to something a little bit more loving and not judgmental. Um, and that was a little scary, you know, because it was like uh, I was learning how to love the people who I think were at first very threatening and frightening to me. And in order to get there, you really have to do a tremendous amount of work to understand the, the nature of uh, the cycle of suffering and bliss that is uh, part of being a human being. So what, do you, what would you say was the scariest or most challenging or darkest, however you want to put that part of that awakening for you? Huh. Well, I, I remember, I mean, when, when the awakening took place for me, which was probably around 20 years ago, um, <laughs> I remember just sitting there feeling a tremendous amount of, um, you know, blissful energy kind of moving through me, and I didn't, like, know what to do about it. And it felt like, um, like I, my mind was trained to want to do something, <laughs> you know? Um, and I was getting really great kind of spiritual advice at the time, which is you don't have to do anything, just allow the bliss to come through. Um, but there were those times I was living very much in the world when sometimes I would be like sort of in the room with someone that might be a little threatening um, and I didn't know really how to handle it. Um, I was on some level very frightened that maybe I was going to get hurt or things like that. And, um, but I think it was learning how to trust um, the rasa, you know, trust the, my own dreams and um, trust the process of, uh, allowing life to unfold and to real, reveal itself however it's going to um, manifest. But I think actually, quite honestly, I think one of the biggest frightening um, experiences I ever had even since then was really when I lost my mom, which was, you know, suddenly it's like the, the reality of death and the experience of the loss and the grief of loss and having to confront what that means, you know, as a human being, both spiritual, intellectual, and uh, philosophically, it just broke open a lot of interesting dynamics of the psyche. And um, uh, I think when we confront death, I think ultimately it's the biggest, um, I think, challenge and most frightening because you can really just all the spiritual stuff can easily just fly out the window <laughs> um, in the confrontation of the aspects of the death and death. Well, I'm really glad you brought that up too. Um, I resonate with you because I lost my dad about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And so I understand basically what you're talking about. It is a shift in perspective and on so many levels. There's no way to describe it unless you've been through it. And then you just know basically what, what the fundamentals are. And mm -hmm. it's, so it's what you said. And I noticed too, at the same time that I've always had like a sensitivity or connection to the spiritual world. And that was just sort of there. And I, you know, I trusted it. I didn't know it so well, but when my dad died mm -hmm. and that opened up, I, I was asking more questions. I was wanting to understand, like from the depths of my soul and my heart, I wanted to understand what is this about? You know, where is he now? Is there connection? All of these things. So this, this uh, a byproduct of that was me opening up spiritually more to the spiritual realm, which I feel like that's going on a lot right now too, because I know a lot of people who have lost people in their lives or had change, which cracked them open like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a crack opening experience. I mean, that's, that's, that's what it kind of goes back to what I was saying before. When we're, when the brain is traumatized uh, by something, it, it shifts the personality. Uh, we become something new. Um, it's, it's a new re a kind of a, a rebirth uh, of the self, sometimes negatively. You know, for those people that never get to um, get to the other side of the healing process. But it's also an incredibly transformational um, if we can get there. You know, I mean, in, this, in the experience of fear, 
Um, there's also an incredible opportunity for um, the light to sort of show itself, which is a kind of a Sufi idea uh, from Rumi, really, is that, you know, the, the light seeps in through our wounds yes. um, idea. And, you know, it's, it's hard to get there, you know, no doubt about it. This is an easy stuff. And, you know, and, and certainly when you're working with, um, you know, clients who are coming in with grieving and, um, traumatic experiences. It's, it's, you know, first it's all about really just recognizing what that feels like and then moving through that image to try to get to the healing aspects of it as well. I mean, you know, again, it's that cycle of death and rebirth and death and rebirth. It, and that happens to the personality over and over and over again so that it can rise to a whole nother consciousness. Yes, I just realized it is literally and figuratively about life and death. Mm -hmm. It's the, the physical form and what's happening within our psyche and our own sense of self as we go through it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, it's, 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 it, it is the big question, right? And I, I think uh, it's, it's something that comes up a lot and that when I'm working with clients and so forth is this idea of mortality and what happens to the soul or the spirit or the, I think the egoic identity of the self. Um, in these moments, uh, and it's really, it is terrifying, but you know, again, this is what we're here for is to experience it all, uh, over and over again in whatever way we're going to. And this way we also get to, um, I think higher levels of consciousness with the right, I think, correct work. Um, you know, and, and that's also what, I mean, you know, we're talking about some really intense stuff here, but you know, uh, that's one of the reasons why. I personally like to bring music into the conversation because it, it plays into this conversation. You know, how do we contend with these overall uh, very threatening, scary um, ideas, you know, about death and, and, and loss and grief and so forth. And to me, there's nothing more beautiful than when it's put to music. Mm. Um, and that's, I think, what we love about music is the way it sort of places all kinds of levels of experience, whether it's death knocking on our door into a series of notes like Beethoven, and it becomes such a magical, life-affirming experience. Um, uh, and also very healing for people when they kind of study it or when they kind of listen to these vibrations and frequencies that are speaking to them, unconscious fears. Um, and that's, I think, uh, it's funny, I think we were, we're talking about a lot of different things here, but it's interesting how it all kind of comes together for me personally when the conversation turns to how music heals, how the unconscious heals and the conversation of dreams and what are dreams and do we experience death inside of dreams and all that kind of stuff it really gets fascinating. It is fascinating. And it all leads back unto each, unto yeah. itself. Right. I mean, that's, that's as we kind of uh, look at these things and expand out and come back, it's really interesting to see, you know, all is one and all is connected. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up the subject of music again, because for me personally, um, my truest language is, is energy. And what I mean by that is the frequency and resonance and quality, tonality mm -hmm. of energy, whether it's vocal or a thought form or music. So looking at it from that fundamental base, I'm fascinated. And of course, I, music, music, music has been one of my, how do I say, it's been it's been like a, a companion for me all of my life. It's been a guide. It's been a light. It's been something that's helped me through some very dark times. And it's, it's just something that I enjoy with all of my heart and soul. And so it's a fascinating topic as to how this, what is, what's happening in terms of the, the resonance and the, the energy with music in our, ourselves, in our minds. Can you speak to that a little more? Well, I, I think you're, you're saying something that's really important, right? Which is this idea of language. And, and that's what it all comes back to is this idea of communication, language, and our experience of life, emotions, feelings, um, events, 
um, that take place in our lives. Um, but music is, is, is a language. It is a communication between the gaps, wow. really, of what we're perceiving and what we experience. And this, this is an idea that I think became very interesting to me when I started to study music from the perspective of, say, John Cage, who was a composer in the 60s, who experimented a lot with the idea of noise and silence as music, um, because it is vibrations, it is frequencies, and it's organized noise, to quote him. Mm. You know, um, but it's organized noise of the unconscious. And one of the things that, uh, say John Cage was interested in and wrote extensively about, which is this idea that music brings us into the psychological. It brings us into the internal world and connects us to the external world. So there is this experience of the external and the internal and the gap between that, because one of the ideas here is that um, words and language don't fulfill the need of expression and for the exception of maybe some of the great poets um, the idea of, of putting words to our experiences is very frustrating mm -hmm. and so music resorts to the frequencies and the vibrations of affect in a way that other arts uh, I don't think they they do. They do in different ways. They're also equally expressive and healing, but music does it on a vibrational level that is really quite um, healing and beautiful. Um, beauty in the, in the sense of like what James Hillman refers to beauty, which is really the return of the true nature of existence, which is love um, and light and, and, and a movement of soul towards the wholeness that it's seeking. Music can drive us in that direction because it kind of defies the limitations of the word and moves into the abstract uh, in a way that, you know, other arts I don't think uh, do in the same way anyway. Um, so there is this idea also that all human beings, language, um, experiences are happening on some vibration and frequency mm -hmm. and we're perceiving it and that's music. <laughs> you know, each soul or each spirit, each being has its own key, its own combination of a raga, notes, mm -hmm. um, that become a piece of music. And that's kind of the cornerstone or the foundation of my work when I compose music to client, with clients to their dream which is the fundamentals of my work as a psychologist, um, which is the idea of taking the unconscious and actually using those frequencies and vibrations in order to come up with something that is expressive in a way that talk therapy can't really do justice to. Um, it's one thing to say I, I experienced something last night in my sleep that was very scary. It's another thing to actually go into the vibration of it which then becomes musical. I don't know if that kind of, does that kind of answer your question or the point yes. of direction? Yeah. Yes, yes, it does. And, and the thought came to mind of, if, you, if music is a universal language, what is the element within music that speaks to everybody? What's that common denominator? Well, it, it's feeling, it's, it's emotions. You know, the, the, what, we, what we find in the universal language is the vibrations of each um, I think uh, feeling, um, whether it's love, hate, anger, joy, bliss, whatever we want to call it, um, grief, um, when, it's, when it's placed into a musical, uh, I guess, terminology, so to speak, or semiology, um, it becomes more open to the collective experience mm. as opposed to just the personal experience. So, you know, we'll, we'll kind of make this more simple for those, you know, for people who love music, you know, Elton John sings a song about love, you know, he might be drawing that from his own personal experience of love, but when we hear it, we're experiencing our experience of love and it becomes very universal in the collective uh, unconscious way uh, that we're not aware of. <laughs>
Right. Hence the resonance. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think that that I think that's kind of points at the direction of what you're referring to there, is this uh, music as this universal language. But I think most importantly, though, is the semiology uh, concept of music as the uh, as a as a collection of vibrations and organized vibrations and frequencies that are attempting to close the gap between our experience of an image or something that's happening out there and how we're perceiving it. Mm -hmm. um, that's where it really becomes musical. And that's a, that's an idea that, you know, I, I got fascinated by when I was reading, there's a, there's a writer out there named Nicholas Cook and he was writing a lot about the imagine the function of imagination and the culture of music. Wow. And um, it had a lot to do with psychology. Uh, I don't think he meant it that way. I'm not sure. But um, I, I, I thought it, it was kind of the closest we, it came because he was kind of being inspired by guys like Barta and uh, other writers and thinkers who get into this philosophical experience of the phenomenology of the image and our reception of it and how it impacts us. Um, you know, so that, that's kind of, um, I think the beauty of music is that it, it, it bridges this gap and goes beyond, again, this idea of the spoken word. Because, you know, when psychologists do their work, it's mainly talk therapy. Mm -hmm. Me talking to somebody and we're just kind of going back and forth and we're trying to kind of move through some really uh, difficult experiences with the word. But when you kind of go beyond that, um, you're really kind of, you're, you're tuning into soul. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of what's happening through another human being. You tune into the collective unconscious soul and it becomes bigger than just two people talking. Right. And I, it, so it circumvents the linear mind for one thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's also another way of kind of throwing a bone <laughs> for the ego to kind of go ah. one direction so <laughs> the self can expose itself, reveal itself, and be vulnerable um, in a way that um, usually feels very threatening, especially when you're working with people who suffer from paranoid delusional experiences and that sort of stuff. Yes. And, you know, as you were speaking, I, I, this is more on a physiological level, but I couldn't help but thinking about the reverberation, the resonance of the sound of music. We are so much water our, in our physical makeup. Mm -hmm. Our cells to our very mitochondria, our very, you know, basis of who we are, that's all affected by music, by the, the vibrations. I mean, and as a, as um, a full body sensory experience, you know, that, that's part of it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, you bring something up there that is very important in understanding the impact of music on the body, on, the, on a soulful level. Um, we are made of water, and it is true um, that... Um, uh, we're made of water and music impacts water. I think you're referring to some of those really wonderful experiments that were done where they played yeah. or yelled at, mu at water and it actually showed atomic molecules changing. Um, yes. and, and that becomes like, how do we um, receive and perceive uh, anger or love or whatever it might be um it does affect us so music vibrationally goes right in there and it changes our chemistry um, on a quantum level as well and that that actually becomes very exciting um that's a that's a big part of the work um and there's like you know there's there's a lot of talk about music and its impact on the quantum level um neurological level um that's done by like guys like Damasio and uh, Daniel Siegel, uh, great writers and thinkers about neurological change through vibrations and frequencies, not talking specifically about music, but it is this idea of how we are all impacting each other um, through vibrations and so forth. So music really, again, it's another way of connecting the neural networks and the on a quantum level. Um, and again, I do see all of it as 
units of images that are attempting to find healing within itself. So all of it is kind of hitting a, a highway leading to individuation and wholeness. But to just decode it, decipher it, analyze it, break it down, make sense of the world, which is what this is all about, is not an easy task, but it certainly is much more enjoyable for me personally when, it, when it's in the form of uh, musical notes. <laughs> and that enjoyment, uh, there's a lot to be said about that in itself in terms of um, the medicinal effect medicinal effect that music has on us, the, the joy, what that does physiologically for ourselves, for our outlook, for our belief. I mean, this, this can go in so many directions because it's, it's so holographic in the end, right? It all will come back. But it's, um, you know, Bruce Lipton, the biology of belief, like the thought of our beliefs, the vibration, the tonality of our beliefs and how that impacts our biology, our cells. So music, that that uh, upliftment and that joy and that bliss and, and just the, the chills and the, the, all of that satisfaction that you can get from listening to a good piece of music, that plays in as well to our body, mind, spirit level. Yeah, it, it also, I mean, okay, a couple of things that came up for me when I was listening to you is, is it because this is, I think, music as a medicinal uh, component of uh, soul <laughs> goes back to the beginning of time um, and was used in very ancient civilizations very definitely especially in China with Tao the Tao of music is uh, very interesting very um, medicinal music was off was actually created as a medicinal so to speak without used they weren't using the word but um, as a way to heal the body through, you know, whether it's banging a drum or um, using bowls and, and vibrations created from various inanimate objects to animate the soul and the molecules and the frequencies and the neural networks within to find healing. And this is also a nice uh, alternative option to say, uh, medication that we use in the contemporary world but when you go back to ancient civilizations and Greek societies actually even in ancient Greece they, they use music um, all the time as, as a medicinal um, uh, component to working with ailments in different parts of the suffering uh, experience of life um, and then there was uh, there's there's another aspect to this that is also really important to recognize, which is music has an ability. I mean, other art forms do as well, but I'm just gonna I'm a composer, so I'm gonna use music as my springboard for it. But the word empathic becomes very important. It's a big component of the healing process in psychotherapy and in general. But when music has an ability to be empathic, um, it, it kind of goes inside an experience in a way that other people go, yeah, I feel that way too. And that's the healing aspect of it. You know, it's like when you're sitting with someone, they go, I really get it because Okay, it's one thing to be sitting with someone and saying, yeah, I, feel, I know what it feels like to lose somebody. Yeah, it's very painful and scary. And that's one thing. And they go, okay, yeah, it makes me feel good. But, man, you put some music to it. And well, here's, here's what I got when, I was, when you were talking about the loss of a father or something and come up with some real intense uh, musical combinations of, of, of octaves and, and notes and that's something else. It kind of goes, whoa, that's that. That really gets to me. That's like really feeling the empathic, um, I think, therapeutic components of music in a way that, you know, is really interesting. And I don't think we generally think of it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea of empathy in music. And that's, again, one of the big reasons why I've attempted to bring music into my practice as a therapeutic psychoanalytic tool not as music therapy, and it's a big distinction that I make because I think music therapy is about changing behavior, existing behavior, to channel relaxation and mindfulness in that way, which I think is great. But what I'm interested in is music as an empathic tool mm -hmm. that actually brings us into deep space of soul and expression and experience of the human condition in a way that is touching and moving and passionate and exciting and sensual all at the same time. So it really brings in this other aspect to healing that I think is very beautiful. 
and and that's and that's this is the thing to me is that healing recovery can be beautiful it doesn't have to be this horrible experience where we come uh, to you know just regurgitate our pain and suffering definitely and i'm glad you brought up the word empathy because in my in my experience and what i'm seeing myself is that becoming more empathic is a huge 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 part of us awakening and yes. the conscious evolution that's taking place right now that mm. connection that respect that compassion that honoring of others that loving of others i mm -hmm. mean this is that cohesion that's being i think uh the momentum that's growing i see it because the more i think in this process of breakdown the more than we come into ourselves in our own heart the more there's self-love then there's this exposure and this rawness and this vulnerability and openness then to extend to other people with this love and this empathy. And this is, this is what I'm seeing um, as one of the main foundational things right now with what's going on in the world. Yeah, and I think, you know, I mean, this is, I think, a very important point, right? Which, I mean, you know, when you talk about the political culture of 2017 and everything that's going on in the world right now, and, and the way people perceive it, you know, again, this is about perception. This is about how we break things down in our minds and try to make sense of it and what is really happening. What people are reacting to, uh, without naming names, is a narcissism um, <laughs> that um, is very pervasive in the world, not just in our political structures, but there's a narcissism that comes into play in our everyday lives. It's very frightening. When someone is the uh, victim of abuse, what is missing? Empathy. Right. If there was empathy, there would not, this would wipe out abuse. No one would hurt someone else if they really understood what it was like to be that or what was going on or how it was going to affect us on a soulful level. Um, but we don't operate in that kind of high level of consciousness. Nobody does. Um, but what's missing, right, and what frightens people the most is when we come across the narcissistic shadow, which I am not going to say America owns, but the world on a global collective level uh, has, which is a narcissistic wound. What people experience is aloneness. Mm -hmm. They are experiencing something that is fundamentally the probably the biggest uh threat to life is the experience of being alone um, no one's listening no one understands me nobody hears me and when you have a culture that embraces any kind of um i think movement towards something that is more narcissistic rather than empathic, you're really gonna open up a very big fear and wound of culture that needs to resolve itself if the human species is going to, um, you know, last <laughs> and survive whatever transformation we're gonna be going through as we move through these times. Again, it's that idea of, um, uh, life and death happening all over again often and uh -huh. hitting us in the nose and waking us up to different realities and again I think the people are are having very interesting conversations all of a sudden I mean as a psychologist and a composer I have to say um, suddenly the conversations on news shows and in the culture today become very interesting because they're talking about narcissism and empathy without actually using those words in a way that is very exciting to me actually because i thought this existed throughout time and it needs to be confronted we need to understand what this means and how this is going to impact us and what is the healing component is to listen uh, we need to listen to other cultures you know we need to hear what they're saying when they're critical of our culture. And we need to have love uh, become a universal language uh, in order to get there um, without getting too preachy here, but. <laughs> no, I mean, what you're saying is absolutely on point. And it, we've been talking about the individual a lot, but it is a global 
a phenomena. And this is how the collective, I mean, it's, it's, it's who we are. And this is very important what you're saying. And, and I understand this separation and, and um, disconnect that you're mm. talking about is yeah. very painful. It's very- That's painful. a big word. Separation. That's what people are experiencing on a very uh, intense level. Uh, separation, polarization, mm-hmm. um, the, the, but ultimately we're all kind of in this together, <laughs> you know, um, and it does bring very important, interesting ideas. Uh, I don't know how far we want to go with it, but it's like the concept of separation becomes also part of the primal wound and the experience of coming into the world and being with the mother and then separated from the mother including the father and how we make up for the uh, the deception of that separation because right. I think it's a deception mm-hmm. um, and we try to come back to wholeness and that we are all in this together and actually in, on some bigger conscious level we we can come back together on this somehow but it takes a lot you know and but it's, it's terrifying but it also brings up a lot of primal wounds um, but the idea of separation being heard being listened to having empathy and then you know um, moving towards that combination of love and action uh, becomes a really interesting um, I think that's what I'm hearing in the world right now. How do we how do we put love into action in a world where it feels very threatening? Yes, and I would add unification to that as well. Love and unification, the connection. Yes, unification. Yeah, thank you. That's really excellent. Excellent, because unification is associated with the concept of individuation, which is wholeness. Mm-hmm. Two halves coming together. The whole kind of uh, concept of uh, the completion of the mandala, which is the shadow and the light coming together in one. But, you know, it's it's, it's an ongoing process, and we go through it on a daily basis uh, every every day of our lives, I think. It is, and it's such a rich and in-depth uh, discussion, and you can come from it, obviously, from different levels, different, you know, that's what's so rich. As we're talking about all of this, it's mm-hmm. all in this, like, say, mandala container and it all mm-hmm. interrelates and it's all you know it becomes um it's very well it's very symbolic too yes. how, it, how it mirrors and how it affects and yes and um i hate to cut this conversation <laughs> short we <laughs> having yeah. said that because there's it's so a bit of, we really hit on a lot of stuff here i hope it all makes sense i don't know that's a lot a lot a lot of different material and uh, um and I, I do hope it it does kind of serve uh, the function of trying, we're all trying to make sense of this world in a way that leads us towards something that is more healing and not destruction. Absolutely. And it, there was a lot, and I loved that there was a lot because these are all seeds that will land on each person that needs to hear what they need to hear. So mm-hmm. I have no doubt that it was uh, divinely orchestrated in that way and that there's a lot to consider and uh, for me, it's just fascinating to to delve into this kind of thing and very healing. Just even having this kind of com- this kind of conversation is a connection, and there's a an empathy and an understanding in itself, which is um, is really the the end result of what we're talking about. So I have no doubt that it will go out in that way to others as well. Mm-hmm. I hope so. Yes. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I get lost in these ideas so much because I get excited. I, I think it's a, there's an excitement to being able to talk about this type of stuff, and it doesn't happen that often, you know. Well, there's an animation, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, an animation to it's actually soul making uh, animation, which is very interesting ideas and in what we're all trying to access. Right, and I can feel it settling on that level of myself. I mean, I feel it revert. It's not just here, you know. I feel it in my heart. Yeah. I, feel, I feel it down deeper in my my soul, my myself. Yeah, it, it's also a hopeful, uh, I think, uh, solution to trying to understand the dilemma of existence and life in mm-hmm. general, you know. And it's and it, I, I think what's also exciting about it, without going too deep into this again, which is. It's also a movement towards the spiritual while it doesn't feel like new age kind of um, hoopla. (laughs) 
New Age ideas, but this is what we're talking about here is the fundamental experiences of life uh, on a clinical level, on a therapeutic level, on a phenomenological level, the experience of life um, that is very real and not so, you know, we're going to put our faith into things that don't make sense to us. No, we're going to put our faith in things that do make sense to us, which is being heard, being understood, mm -hmm. um, being expressed through music, through dreams, whatever it may be. And that's where we come together, hopefully, and, and have a, an uplifting conversation about consciousness. Exactly. And I believe you're talking about making sense to us. That's, a, that's another point where as we evolve and become extrasensory and just more expanded in our awareness and knowledge, I think other things that may not have made sense before are making more sense. And, and actually, a lot of these things are very innate to who we are, you know, as children coming in before we've been, before different things come into play and limitations and restrictions come onto us and our mind gets more fixed about the, the nature of reality and uh, who we are in it all. So I just wanted to add that too, because I see this is like opening up more and more as people are going along this path. Yeah, absolutely. I also just want to acknowledge you for uh, having this conversation, for having these conversations that you're having with other brothers and sisters that are into different ideas and so forth. And, and I think it's great that you're creating a vehicle here for whatever expressions that people are into. And uh, I think it's great. And we'll acknowledge that as a great contribution to soul as well. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. There's, there's almost nowhere I'd rather play than in this. So it's, it's my pleasure and my joy to be able to do this. Beautiful. Um, so with just a few minutes left, any final words you want to leave us with? Um, I think we've really said it all. I, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what's left to say about anything. I think it's um, understanding the importance of of following your internal dreams, uh, the importance of understanding your own unconscious and how it's got ties to your reactions, our reactions um, to life, uh, to stay hopeful. Uh, there's a steadiness that I call for uh, in people, including myself. Steady, steady, watch the reactions, watch the ego, watch where we're going, allow the imagination, uh, the beauty of the magic of consciousness and unconsciousness is uh, really magnificent and beautiful in all its shadows and its light, you know, and to embrace both as it comes in a way that is all pushing us as a whole towards healing, all of it, everything, everything is pushing us towards healing in some odd way. We might very uncomfortable but I think that's basically the most hopeful message we can kind of shoot at right now is to see the playfulness of the shadow <laughs> so, you know. yeah there is a magnificence to this uh, alchemy right this process we're going through exactly. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I mean that's that's the whole idea that's why putting music to dreams uh, as part of my work um, is it's it seems like the the most therapeutic approach to what those those everything that's happening in life that feels you know scary um, you know the forest uh, a, a forest made of trees that are attacking us in the middle of a nightmare actually become healing arms that are not just attacking us but they're they, they have a language of their own that needs to be heard. Um, and that's, again, it's all part of the, the, the uh, breaking down of images into vibrations and symbols that are all part of this matrix that is life. And it's quite astonishing and quite miraculous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that it is very miraculous. And I'm glad that you said that because it re really is. And I'm really, I'm fascinated and thank you for doing the work you're doing with the music and the dreams and just bringing music into, more into focus with the healing and, and what's happening right now in humanity. And um, it's a powerful force and a beautiful one. And so I just, I love what you're doing there with the music. Thank you. It, it's, um, it's, an, it's a nice, it's, it feels very, um, I think, healing uh, to do this kind of work. And it's a way of doing seva service.
Mm -hmm. working with people. Um, so it is, it's a blessing and I feel very fortunate to be able to do what I'm doing. Um, and, uh, I, I, again, thank you for giving me this vehicle to talk about it. Yeah, my pleasure. Definitely my pleasure. Well, I guess we'll have to wrap it up here, Michael. Um, but it's been wonderful speaking with you and thank you everyone for joining us in this conversation. And, um, yeah, so we'll leave it at that. I appreciate you being here and spending the time with us and look forward to more of your work. Okay, thank you very much. Good deal. Okay, put my book down. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you.